look at the incredible beauty of the Hagia Sophia Church in Istanbul that was built by Roman Emperor Justinian as the Christian Cathedral of Constantinople, today's Istanbul, for the State Church of the Roman Empire between 532 and 537 AD. The church is considered the epitome of Byzantine architecture and it is said to have changed the history of architecture. It's uh, an incredible monument, uh, even today. It was later converted into a mosque, then uh, uh, in 1935, the Secular Republic of Turkey established it as a museum, and then only a couple of years ago, in 2020, it actually reopened as a mosque. Hello everyone, welcome back to this series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. The Church of Hagia Sophia is only one of the many things that Emperor Justinian left to us today, to our world, to Western civilization. And probably not even the most important, not even the most uh, solemn and uh, incredibly beautiful. He left many churches, but uh, most importantly, from a juridical point of view, he left us the Corpus Juris Civilis, or he reorganized all the laws of the Roman Empire into a more scaled down, simplified and structured, very organized corpus or a series of organized books. Justinian is the protagonist, the only protagonist, the only character, uh, if not for a little part at the, at the very end, of Canto VI of Paradiso. Canto VI of Paradiso is uh, a unique canto under many points of view. It has a, a grandiosity about it because it's a, a single monologue by Emperor Justinian. And so even if it is just like Canto VI of Inferno and Canto VI of Purgatorio, the political canto of Paradiso, of the Cantica, it is more important than the, than the previous two for different reasons. Um, and we can see it. Dante shows us the importance of this canto, first by giving the monologue the broadest possible space in the canto that he has ever given. No other monologue is as long as Justinian's monologue in this canto. Second, from the point of view that it's uh, spoken, this monologue is spoken from uh, uh, a blessed soul, who is Justinian, and therefore his voice is entirely aligned with the voice of God. It's almost as if it was divinely inspired and this was the voice of God telling us what he has to tell us in Canto VI as opposed to Purgatorio and, uh, and Chaco in Inferno. We remember Canto VI in Inferno, it was Chaco, the character, and Canto VI in Purgatorio, it was by Sordello. Chaco was uh, looking locally, provincially, at the civil war in Florence. Sordello was lo looking at Italy, I Italia, uh, the peninsula and the, the, all the wars in Italy. Now the horizon is broadened at its uh, utmost by Justinian. He's looking at the entire world or empire. This is another reason why this canto is more important than the other canto six. But let's just uh, focus on this uh, uh, immense character of Emperor Justinian and uh, his empire. He actually was emperor from uh, 527 AD to 565. He reigned from uh, Byzantium, from the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And uh, we should ask ourselves why. Why Dante is choosing Justinian out of all emperors to be the voice of of the Roman Empire in his Commedia, in this particular canto. So one reason for sure is that Dante saw Justinian as the emperor who reunified the entire Roman Empire. And uh, in a certain sense, that's actually what happened because through different wars and campaigns, um, Africa, Italy, all those uh, domains that had been previously invaded by barbars, uh, the Goths, uh, the Vandals, etc., were in fact uh, reconquered, uh, if not in, in their entirety, at least in the majority of them, by Justinian's troops in the West. And therefore, there was a certain reunification. It doesn't matter too much that later on uh, they were then, uh, they didn't really stick together and there were 
successive problems. Um, this is one of the reasons why Dante chooses Justinian, because he really had the role of the unifier. And Dante is seeing a virtue in trying to, in the effort of bringing all the empire together, in, in bringing unity. And this was the political unity. On the other hand, and probably this is the second reason why Dante chooses Justinian, is the legal unity, the immense effort that Justinian spearheaded and uh, led to create this corpus juris civilis, which is the foundation uh, of uh, all the jurisprudence and all the law of uh, the, the West that is still um, valid today, at least for the countries who apply civil law as opposed to common law. He decided to take all the different uh, uh, laws that were very unorganized around the empire, uh, compile them. Of course, uh, it was a, an immense work that took a lot of specialists uh, over many years, but he dedicated his own time to work on this. So, as I mentioned, we can see Canto VI as a mini Aeneid because Dante takes a lot from Virgil, but, uh, and so, but obviously it's a theologized history of Rome. So under the, the light of Christianity. And therefore, it's not only Virgil uh, that Dante takes as a model, but he also takes a lot of Augustine as a model for, for this canto. And the two models are, in fact, uh, very different from each other. From Virgil's side, we have a model that sees Rome as uh, the utmost uh, virtue. You can only celebrate Rome and everything that it um, represents. Nothing else, because from Virgil's side, there was paganism and uh, Christianity really did not have anything to do with uh, the Aeneid of Virgil. From Augustine's side, it was very different, because um, the Roman Empire for Augustine was not something to be simply celebrated or even single-mindedly celebrated like, like Virgil does. In fact, he thought that this uh, um, unity of people under the empire and this uh, social contract that uh, Cicero had talked about in his De Republica never actually materialized, never took place, because the empire was nothing else than uh, the materialization of uh, uh, what he called uh, the lust for domination, the lust of domination of the most uh, powerful, people, powerful people. So for Augustine, given that he saw things under a Christian light and therefore under God, what mattered to him was the spiritual development of people. And in his uh, City of God, he talks about the City of God as opposed to a City of Man. Therefore, the necessity of a spiritual development from the City of Man to the, the City of God. And the City of Man, par excellence, was Rome. And in his work, The City of God, Augustine talks about uh, his ideas that uh, the Roman Empire was not an instrument of God. He was not the instrument of uh, divine providence, like Dante sees the Roman Empire. For Augustine, the most important thing was this spiritual renovation. And Augustine didn't care too much whether the spiritual re renovation came from the Roman Empire or even through uh, barbaric invasions. For example, Augustine mentions that, mentions that the Goths coming into Italy might have been partially um, willed by God, because that might have, uh, um, let's say, awakened the, the morals and the spirits of the people in, in, the, in, the, in Italy. So it's a very different uh, point of view. He's not entirely pessimistic about the empire, but it's certainly on a, on a very different and almost opposite place from where Virgil comes from. And as always, Dante tries to create a harmony, tr tries to synthesize and harmonize uh, different ancient positions. The tone and the language that Justinian uses in uh, speaking in his monologue are really very high. It's a very high language, full of, uh, uh, let's say, sophisticated uh, terms. We're going to see which ones. Some of these terms, actually, Dante almost made up, or he used very archaic and common terms. So this, we need to remember, is the greatest Byzant Byzantine emperor speaking. And this, is, uh, th this makes uh, the entire canto even more exciting if we, if we think about uh, 
the strength that was behind it. And uh, personally, I love how Dante, from uh, the heights of the conversations about the, the public sphere, the empire, and the entire history of, of Rome, he is, uh, as he's done in other cantos, he's then able, towards the end, to go from the macroscopic level to the microscopic le level and remind us that, at the end of the day, the human being, the man, and sometimes even the individual, is uh, uh, at the center of this uh, incredible story that is willed by God, that is history. Poscia che Costantin l'Aquila volse, contra il corso del ciel che la seguio, dietro all'antico che la vina tolse, cento e cent'anni e più l'uccel di Dio, nello stremo d'Europa si ritenne, vicino a monti, de quai prima uscio. He's already said something like a hundred things in, uh, in ten seconds. Um, he is already told us that uh, he's going to talk about the Roman Empire uh, using the emblem of the eagle. So throughout the entire canto, Dante is going to use this uh, symbol, which was uh, almost as if, almost like a flag for a country today. This uh, golden eagle that was everywhere in the empire was the symbol of Rome. And poscia che Costantin l'Aquila volse, Constantine, in the 4th century, turned the, the eagle uh, from uh, west to east, because uh, he, let's say, closed down Rome and allegedly sold it to the church, and then uh, and moved the center of, or the capital of the Roman Empire to Byzantium. This happened in uh, 330 AD. Now Dante is making a similar here, he's saying, counter to heaven's course, counter to heaven, heaven's course for two reasons. One reason is that the stars were apparently moving from east to west, and so he's going against the natural direction of, uh, of nature. And in this sense, he's already doing something that is in itself wrong, that is carrying some, some kind of mistake in it. But even more important, the direction of history, under a teleological narration of history for Dante and for uh, many Christian philosophers, the entirety of history was really following the uh, civilization of the Roman Empire and therefore starting from uh, Troy, where Aeneas came from, which was out in the east, from Troy then moving to Rome, and as the Roman Empire expanded towards, uh, you know, farther west, Spain, etc., we would get to potentially the end of, of history. In this grand uh, fresco of a historic vision, Dante is saying Constantine was an undue interruption in this great migration from east to west. And this is why I also admire Justinian so much, because he took the eagle again and uh, took it back by reunifying the empire that had been uh, split by Constantine. The ancient one who wed Lavinia, uh, of course, is Aeneas, and uh, 100 and 100 years and more, this is the time that went from, the, from when Constantine um, split the empire until uh, the moment when Justinian became emperor, and that was 527 AD. So this is what Justinian is, is saying. In this moment, uh, the bird of God, this emblem of the Roman Empire, remained near Europe's borders in Byzantium, close to the peaks from which it first emerged. This is the Troy, or the region where Troy was, which is really not too far from Byzantium. And beneath the shadow of the sacred wings, which is a literal phrase taken from the Bible, from Psalm 16, it ruled the world from hand to hand until it came into my hands. This is Justinian putting himself in the history of the Roman Empire. Justinian introduces himself, Cesare fui, Cesare is Caesar, so emperor, I, I was an emperor, Cesare fui, e son Justiniano, I was Justinian, I am Justinian, che per voler del primo amor chi sento, il primo amor or first love is the, the Holy Spirit, 
for the will of the Holy Spirit, dentro le leggi trassi il troppo il vano. This is another one of those really thick verses because dentro le leggi, among all the laws, I took out two things. What, whatever was troppo, which means too much, and whatever was vano, which literally means uh, vain. But the too much is uh, referred to any laws that were um, contradictory and repetitive. So, too much in this sense. And then when he says vano or vain, he really refers to laws that were either too ancient and therefore superfluous, or useless and therefore superfluous. In this case, vain. Mandelbaum calls them remove the vain and the needless from the laws. And you can see there is a slight difference there. E prima che io l'ora fosse attento, even before I started this great work of the Corpus Juris Civilis, una natura in Cristo esser non più è credea. Here Justinian is confessing his own heresy. He was uh, a believer of the, I think it's pronounced monophysite, monophysite heresy, which uh, in short was the heresy that did not admit the human nature of Christ. Under this uh, idea, Jesus Christ, uh, at incarnation, he received the divine nature, and therefore in that moment only he was human and divine. But right after incarnation and for the rest of all his life, he was only divine and not human. For Christian doctrine, Jesus Christ is both fully human and fully divine. This was a very hot topic, Uh, in uh, the Christianity of the first centuries, and then it was uh, settled, let's say, with council after council, and it was settled in uh, both natures in the same person at the same time. What's interesting is that Dante plays a little bit with the times. Uh, we don't know if he didn't know or not, but uh, the way he tells the story here, he makes it sound like uh, only after Justinian converted to full orthodoxy, uh, orthodoxy and therefore Christianity, thanks to the, the work and the support of Il Benedetto Agapito, who was in fact uh, Pope Agapitus I, who is the one who gets credit for having brought Justinian back to the orthodoxy. Uh, he started only after the moment, according to Dante, he started working on the big um, law and juridical work that was the Corpus Iuris Civilis. In fact, we know today that Justinian started working on the Corpus Iuris Civilis before uh, this conversion or reconversion happened. In any case, it, it sounds better the way Dante tells uh, the story, and he takes this license for himself, and he says, uh, let's uh, use the Mandelbaum translation, I did believe him, and now clearly see his faith as you with contradictories can see that one is true and one, one is false. So it's really interesting here because uh, he is quoting uh, Aristotle's uh, first principle, which is, uh, you know, under the logic of Aristotle, this was the first principle, the, the principle of non-contradiction, by which uh, um, if two statements are contradictory, one must be false and the other one must be true. So on earth, We believe that because things work like that, but in heaven is the place where things uh, do not work like that necessarily, and therefore he believes that now that he's in heaven, in this apparent contradiction of the fully human and fully divine natures coexisting in the flesh of Christ, in a way that is so sure and uh, undoubtful, just like the first uh, principle of uh, Aristotelian logic. So he, he flips logic around in a very interesting way. Entrusting to my Belisarius my arms. So Belisarius was his greatest general of Justinian. And uh, as I mentioned before, he was dedicating himself to intellectual activities, in particular the building of the Corpus Iuris Civilis, while uh, Belisarius was fighting his battles uh, outside of Italy for the most part. He, in fact, uh, fought the Vandals and uh, defeated them and uh, sent them out of Africa, reconquering Africa for the Roman Empire. He also kicked the Goths out of Italy. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, even if this uh, didn't last for a long time, during Justinian's times, this reunification actually happened, and a lot of that 
merit is of Belisarius. In fact, uh, there is a, a legend, or maybe it's a part of history, that Belisarius was not really benefiting of uh, a lot of gratitude by Justinian at the end of his life. He might even have ended up in a prison and blinded by Justinian. There is a, a sort of echo of what happened to Pierre de la Vigna and maybe an echo of uh, what Dante will uh, refer to at the end of this canto. So here we have Justinian starting to really get into the meat of the matter for, for Dante. And he's referring to the Ghibellines and the Guelphs. Um, he says, uh, So that you may see with uh, how much reason they attack the sacred standard, those who seem to act on its behalf and those opposing it. Those who seem to act on its behalf are the Ghibellines, who seem to appropriate the standard, the, empi the empire standard, even if they do it for themselves, uh, with a selfish reason, instead of doing it for the empire. And those who oppose it are the Guelphs, who are on the side of the papacy and uh, working with the, the royals of France. Where Dante says, uh, con quanta ragione, at verse 31st, tu veggi con quanta ragione, he is in fact using some irony here, because ragione means reason, and uh, Mandelbaum translates it properly, correctly, with reason you see with how much reason they attack the sacred standard, but obviously they don't have any reason to attack the standard. So it's their uh, lack of reason that drives them to attack the standard. This is uh, behind these words. Now, if we read the original, the Italian, from verse 34 onward, it gets really complicated and uh, difficult to understand the meaning of what Dante is saying, because the subject of every one of these sentences remains the standard, the emblem, the, the eagle, basically, is the subject. And uh, I've noticed that, for example, ba Mandelbaum is, uh, to make it clearer, to make his translation clearer, he uses uh, the subject, uh, he repeats the subject, that standard, at least four times in this uh, tercets from uh, verse 34. While Dante never repeats it, he only uses pronouns uh, assuming that we are so smart and we understand what he is talking about. So this is already one difficulty for Italians to understand precisely the structure of Dante's sentences here. In any case, the subject, the, everything that Dante tells here in terms of the history, rotates around this golden eagle, this uh, emblem, this symbol. What is uh, really incredible, I find incredible, is that from verse 34 to only verse 55, more or less, he is summarizing pretty much 700 years of uh, Roman history. Then we have um, all the wars and uh, um, activity of uh, Julius Caesar between 55 and uh, 75, more or less. Then he gives us uh, um, another... 700 if not 800 years of history between 76 verse 76 and verse uh, 97 and and once he gets to Charlemagne in 800 AD he is uh, Dante considers uh, that the history has arrived to his own times because the sacred Roman Empire is the macro context where Dante finds his own life in, even if he was 500 years before his own current time. So if we go back to verse 34, he talks about uh, Pallas, Pallante, morì per dargli regno. Pallas was one of the heroes of the Aeneid. He was one of the, of the heroes who fought together with Aeneas and died for the glory of Rome. Tu sai che il fece in Alba sua dimora. Alba is this uh, town of Alba Longa that was founded by uh, Aeneas' son, uh, Ascanius was Aeneas' son. He founded Alba Longa and uh, Alba Longa remained as, uh, let's say, almost the, the capital or the center of the initial Roman Empire or the Roman kingdom, if we, if we want to call it that in the very beginning, for about 300 years. The eagle stayed there in Alba Longa until then he moved to Rome. E sai che il fe dal mal delle Sabine, al dolor di Lucrezia, in sette regi, vincendo intorno le genti vicine. It's just incredible how many things he hits on with uh, so little words. Il mal delle Sabine, 
it, the rape of the Sabians is a, it's a fact, a very um, evil fact that happened during Romulus, the first king of Rome, of the famous seven kings of Rome that we had to memorize back in uh, Italian schools, the seven kings of, Rome's, of Rome, until Il Dolor di Lucrezia, which is the rape and suicide of Lucrezia, that's uh, another evil fact and uh, against a woman, again, that happened under the last of the seven kings of Rome, who was Tarquinius the Superbus, the last king of Rome. So, he has covered all that period of time of the seven kings of Rome here. There is this little formula that Dante keeps repeating, and you can see it in the Italian. He says, e sai quel fe, and then the tercet after, sai quel che fe, and then you see it a little bit later as well, e quel che fe. This is referring to the emblem, to the eagle, and it means you know what it did, and you know what it did. It's a rhetorical uh, system to tell something that is a, a long history, uh, repeating uh, the same formula, but in this case it, it's really referring to the movement and to the actions and to the events rotating around uh, the, the Golden Eagle. Then we have at verse uh, 43 the first period of the Republic, the, the Republic of Rome, where Sai quel che fe portato dagli egregi romani incontro a Brenno, incontro a Pirro. These were all very famous uh, wars that were uh, won by Rome, but these were invaders that came in. Uh, Brennus was in fact uh, the leader of the Gauls, who was then, who actually came to Rome, to the doors of Rome, and I think there was a big uh, payout. In any case, he got his gold and uh, um, went back in around 390 BC. And then Pyrrhus, king of Epirus, who crossed into Italy in 280 BC and was um, again fought back like other invaders. So, incontro a Brenno, incontro a Pirro, incontro agli altri principi e collegi. He is uh, generalizing here for other invaders and other wars that were won by Rome. Of course, as we know today, uh, more than anything, by their military intelligence, military technology, that was uh, superior to anybody in those times. Esso atterrò l'orgoglio degli Arabi. Interesting how he calls the Carthaginians um, Arabi here, because Arabi was a later word, but in an anachronistic way he calls them Arabi here. Basically, the symbol, still the eagle, crushed the pride of the Carthaginians. We know that uh, in 202 uh, BC, uh, Scipio, the general Scipio, who was then called Africanus because he won the campaign and the wars in Africa, won against uh, Carthago. When they had followed Hannibal across those alpine rocks from which Po you descend. Perfect. And beneath that standard, Scipio Pompey triumphed, and to that hill beneath which you were, you were born, you meaning you Dante, beneath that hill of Fiesole, there is a, a place that is uh, seemed most, the standard seemed most harsh because the whole town was destroyed because uh, there was a voice or a rumor that Catalina had been hosted there by the town. I want to highlight a word that uh, either was extremely unusual or that Dante made up, which is on verse uh, 48, and that's mirro, vol volunteer mirro. This word um, means, uh, let's see how Mandelbaum translates, he says, I gladly honor. So it means to honor, yes, but the etymology comes from mir, mir, the, the material mir, the, the, and so it meant to embalm and to cover with mir, just like uh, they used to cover some corpses with mir and therefore embalm them for honorific sense uh, after their death. And so with verse 55, we get to the, we are, we're getting close to the moment of the Pax Augusta, the moment of peace within the Roman Empire under Augustus, but we're not quite there yet because uh, Dante says, presso al tempo che tutto il ciel volle, we are closer, near the time, when heaven wished to bring all of the world to heaven's way, serene, Caesar, as Rome has willed, took up the standard. And so we, we're talking about Julius Caesar here. There is an important uh, distinction to make from a historic knowledge point of view. Dante's times, everyone in Dante's times, uh, saw Julius Caesar as 
the real first emperor of Rome, while we are used to think of August Augustus Caesar as uh, the first emperor of Rome. So this is the key in which Dante is reading the history of the Roman Empire. Uh, Julius Caesar is the first emperor and therefore he gives uh, Caesar a lot of space in this monologue by Justinian. In fact, Dante dedicates, uh, I believe, five, if not six, tercets to all the story of uh, Julius Caesar, and, uh, you know, and also refers to his uh, blitzkrieg type of war. He was so quick in attacking, and uh, he had so many military techniques that were allowing him to win anywhere he went, until we get to verse 73, where we get to the betrayal and murder of Julius Caesar. In fact, uh, Brutus and Cassius are, um, are mentioned, who we have already seen in, canto, uh, in the last canto of Inferno, in the, mouth, in the mouths of Lucifer. This is why they are howling, they're howling in hell. Nell'inferno latra, col baiulo seguente, di quel che fe col baiulo seguente means uh, the successor of Julius Caesar, is uh, uh, the other Caesar, the next emperor who, bear, who bore the, the eagle, which is uh, Octavian, which is uh, um, Octavian Augustus. He has even a, a whole tercet for Cleopatra. For, uh, he dedicates a whole tercet to Cleopatra. Piangene ancora la trista Cleopatra che, fuggendo l'innanzi, dal colubro, the snake, even if it's a very archaic word that Italians today would not understand, thank you Dante, La morte prese subitana e atra. She, because Octavian um, had, Octavian Augustus had killed Anthony, she didn't want to be prey of the, in the hands of the winner, therefore she killed herself in this, uh, in this way, spectacular way, with the, with the bite of a snake. With Octavian, con costui, corse infino al lito rubro, the eagle, ran until the Red Sea, which is a way for Dante to say Egypt. So Egypt became Roman territory with Octavian. And uh, finally, we get to the Pax Augusta. So, con costui puose il mondo in tanta pace, in so much peace, che fu serrato a Giano il suo delubro. Delubro means uh, temple or tempio. And so the temple of Giano was a temple who, that, uh, which had a door that remained open all the time in times of war. Therefore, it was so peaceful during uh, Augustus that even those doors could be closed. Here we really understand how Dante sees uh, history as guided by the hand of God, guided by the divine providence. Um, God used the empire in Dante's vision to create the conditions, the social conditions, the political conditions for the incarnation. And in fact, the incarnation of, of Jesus happened under Augustus, and in, in these peace conditions. And so we have the incarnation here happening more or less around verse 81-82. But even more important, says Dante, is what happened under the next emperor, that there was uh, Tiberius. In fact, uh, he calls him the third Caesar at verse uh, 86. We are uh, to understand here that la viva giustizia divina che mi ispira, the true justice that inspires me, granted to it, to the, to the eagle, always the eagle, in the next Caesar hand, in Tiberius' hand, the glory of avenging his own wrath. In the time when Tiberius was emperor, his agent, who was Pontius Pilate, decreed the condemnation to death of Jesus Christ. So this is important because, uh, and Dante calls it um, um, avenging of his own wrath because this is God's wrath against uh, the sinful humanity. But really, it's about the juridical infrastructure that Dante is talking here. I think he's making a subtle point, but um, reading from different scholars, most uh, scholars agree that Dante here is referring to the juridical uh, infrastructure that was the, the, the laws of the Roman Empire that allowed to give legitimacy to the death penalty uh, given by Pontius Pilate to Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, um, Dante writes in his De Monarchia, he was his political work, in De Monarchia Dante wrote, uh, if the passion of Christ did not happen 
under a legitimate judge or a legitimate authority, then the penalty wouldn't have been an actual penalty, but a violation of a, of a law, a violation of a right. So the fact that it happened under a legitimate law, and it was legitimately imparted by Pontius Pilate, allowed for the Passion of Christ to actually happen in the way that God wanted it to happen. And Dante continues, and because the emperor had power over all the human peoples, at least within the Roman Empire, uh, for this reason all the men were uh, punished in the flesh of Jesus. Uh, punished is also, and also at the same time redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ. Now, marvel here at what I show to you. It's almost a way for Dante to say, okay, now I said something a little complicated, but I'm going to double down, okay? I've talked about a particular form of vengeance by God, but now I'm talking about another vengeance that follows the, ven the vengeance. And this is under, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem uh, under Emperor Titus that happened in 70 DC. Um, and it's, it's seen by Dante, but also by uh, a general uh, Christian thought in Dante's times as the divine punishment for having killed uh, uh, Jesus. That's why he uses this uh, interesting expression, far vendetta corse della vendetta, vendetta della vendetta. Uh, in English, he heard it toward avenging vengeance, avenging vengeance. And uh, finally, a uh, jump of 700 years, verse 94, and when the Lombard tooth beat the Holy Church, then Charlemagne, under the eagle's wings, through victories he gained, brought help to her. It's Charlemagne in uh, the day of Christmas of the year 800 AD, who is crowned emperor of the sacred Roman Empire and reconstitutes the, the Roman Empire, uh, which for Dante's wishes and desires is still that empire that Dante would hope that could is the only political power that can save Italy from all the civil wars and from, for, from all the intestinal wars, the wars that are ravaging Italy. We can probably say as a comment here that um, Augustine, fr and from this point of view, was a little bit more, had a little bit more foresight than Dante, because under Augustine point of view, it wasn't necessarily the Roman Empire that was being used by God to get to the perfect state for Christianity to thrive and, and to grow. Augustine was a little bit more open-minded and said, God uses many different instruments, not necessarily just one institution. For Dante, it's a bit more of a rigid vision. For him, it's really the two sons, the son of uh, the empire and the son of the church, temporal power and spiritual power. At verse 97, Dante says, O mai può giudicar di quei cotali. Cotali is a pronoun, but uh, Dante uses it in a negative way because he's indicating both Guelphs and Ghibellines. And he says, now you can judge those I condemned above and judge how such men have offended, have become the origin of all your evils. Now that I gave you all the context and the history, you can understand how evil and mistaken both Guelphs and Ghibellines are. I'm going to explain why. Because for some oppose the universal emblem, and these are the Guelphs who are opposing the imperial ensign, with their yellow lilies. When Dante says uh, yellow lilies or um, gigli gialli, gigli gialli, it's kind of musical, he actually means the, the golden lilies that were the, the emblem of the French royals that were supporting the Guelphs. Others, who are the Ghibellines, claim that emblem for party. So they are not thinking about the empire when they use the emblem. They are thinking about themselves. They are thinking about appropriating it for themselves. Let Ghibellines pursue their undertakings. Faccian li Ghibellin, faccian lor arte. A really musical type of invective here. Sotto altro segno, che mal segue quello sempre chi la giustizia e lui di parte. For those who sever this sign and justice are really bad followers. It's time for Justinian to explain to Dante who are the souls that he is meeting here in the planet or in the heaven of Mercury. And these are the souls who have been good 
souls and good um, ratios in their life. However, they acted in a very ratios way, mainly to achieve uh, honor and fame on earth. And therefore, when desires are tend tending towards earth earthly ends, then so deflected the rays of the true love of God mount toward the life above with lesser force. They find themselves uh, to be lesser deserving of the love of God, again, in the gigantic, let's say, hierarchy of heaven, which is not a hierarchy because everybody is blessed e equally. But however, they are a little bit lesser deserving because of this uh, desire of fame that was a driving force in their earthly life. And finally, we get to Romeo, this mysterious uh, character that appears at the very end of the canto. And that I love because we get really from the macro level to this microscopic level of one single individual. This Romeo is somebody who existed in history, is a historic character, Romeo di Villanova. He was Provencal, he was the prime minister of a count, Count, uh, it's called here, Raymond Berenger. Justinian says that Romeo finds himself also in the Mercury heaven, in this type of circle, and uh, his acts were great and noble, but he met ungratefulness. And uh, uh, in history we know that uh, Romeo was uh, a, a very noble, very noble in spirit type of public servant, and uh, he helped his uh, count very much. In fact, uh, like Dante says, it's reported in history that he, he, he in fact made all four of his daughters into queens because he helped marry them to kings in their times, and he was always very faithful, very honest, uh, with a great reputation. However, he ended up uh, in poverty and uh, kicked out of, uh, of the court of this count. This, of course, uh, calls to mind immediately the theme of exile, and therefore, who are we thinking about here? Really, this is Dante's heart. Dante's personality that takes over, in a tragic way, the conclusion of this marvelous canto. He is uh, speaking about Romeo, but much more deeply and much more importantly, he is speaking about Dante Alighieri. This man was called for accounting, one who, given ten, gave Raymond five and seven. He was, without any particular reason, because of rumors, uh, he was called to for his action, actions, and even if he was able to prove that whatever he was given in his care, he had returned always at least 20% of greater value, and therefore he had been a great minister, a great manager, he ended up poor, old, and departed. And uh, his heart is uh, instinctively inserting his own feelings, his own existential situation at the end of this magnificent canto. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much for following this uh, other video. And uh, for the next one, we're going to have Beatrice trying to explain to Dante some issues with what we've been hearing here about the concept of vengeance and uh, about Christ. So it will be better articulated in Canto 7. So stick around. Thank you.